Hi, I'm, I could not be um, happier to, than to be at this um, festival on Martha's Vineyard and to be introduced by um, one of the great, in my opinion, one of the great uh, booksellers in the United States, Dawn Brash, and your wonderful bookstore, The Bunch of Grapes, here. It is just, it's, there are other reasons to come to Martha's Vineyard, but it's my reason to, to come to Martha's Vineyard. It's a wonderful um, institution. So, Dawn has uh, given you quite a buildup about the Black Count. I'll tell you a little about the story, but uh, then I want to talk about the story behind the story. So, it is the story of General Alexander, or Alex Dumas, as he called himself. This is a man who was born the son of a black slave and a renegade French aristocrat on the French sugar island of Saint-Domingue, which would later become Haiti, at the time when it was the center of the world sugar trade. And this was a time when sugar was, to the world economy, what oil is today. It was the most valuable commodity in the world. It, in fact, was the commodity on which Versailles and most of the palaces that we see now in central pa Paris were, were built. They were built on the backs of millions of slaves who were um, brutally worked um, by the French Empire in their sugar islands. But one of these young men, skipping all of his early life, which is in the book, he, I think we'll go to the year 1776, when he arrives in France. And I found the first record of Alex Dumas in France in a ship manifest, where he is listed as a piece of cargo as the slave Alexander. I would further find out the reason he was listed as the slave Alexander was, was, was because his no good uh, white aristocrat father had actually pawned him, pawned his own son into slavery to buy his own ship ticket back to France the year earlier. He didn't have enough money for a ticket, and Alex was the most valuable thing he had with him. But I know that he pawned him, not sold him, because I found this piece of paper that said, I have a right to buy this young man back if I return to France and inherit this great fortune. Indeed, his father inherits a fortune, and Within a year, the young man who is called the Slave Alexander, when he arrives in France, is being trained at the finest fencing academy in the shadow of Versailles. He is being trained in philosophy, equestrianism, um, languages, manners, and of course, sword fighting. And he now has the title, Count, Count Thomas Alexandre David de la Paetrie, somebody who a year earlier was, was just the slave Alexander. Well, another interesting fact about his life was at this fencing academy, his teacher was an incredible man who called himself the Chevalier de Saint-Georges. And the Chevalier de Saint-Georges, as I would find, was actually the acknowledged master swordsman in the world. He was undefeated in the late 18th century. Well, guess what? His mother, he was also black, and his mother was also, in this case, a former slave who was living uh, with him in Paris at the time when he was the greatest fencing teacher in France. So you have the beginning of my story, these two young men who are sword fighting, essentially, in the shadow of the French court at the time when France is running the most brutal and lucrative slave empire in the world. So there are a few ironies there at the beginning of his life. Well, jump ahead 10 years. He has a break with his father. He, 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 he gives up his title of count. And um, he goes to a re army recruiting station. And he signs the army recruitment register. Again, I'm writing this. Uh, this is, I'm sort of like flying blind on this story, so I'm just, uh, no one has ever followed his traces before like this. And so here I am thrilled when I go through the army recruitment roles and I try to find when, when this man became a soldier. And I find that in the year 1786, for the first time in history, someone has signed the, the, the name Alexander Dumas 
on a piece of paper. And that is because his real name at that time was Count Thomas Alexandre David de la Paetrie, because that was his, you know, bastard father's name uh, that he wanted to get rid of. And he kept the Alexander, which had been with him his whole life. And he took the name Dumas after his mother, meaning of the plantation where he had left her in, um, in, in, in Haiti. Well, a lot of things happened in quick succession. I would find that he and his former fencing teacher, the Chevalier de Saint-Georges, form a legion when the French Revolution breaks out in 1789, they form a legion they call the Legion of Free Americans. Well, why do they call it the Legion of Free Americans? Well, actually, I would find it's because everybody in this uh, corps of cavalrymen who formed a fight for the revolution, they are all either black or mixed race. Most of them have a slave mother, and they call themselves the Legion of Free Americans because at the time in Paris, 200 years before Gene Kelly did Americans in Paris, I would find that Americans in Paris at that time were assumed to be black men from the colonies who were living there. And they were not an insignificant number who were. Within five years, this young man who joins the army at, at, as a corporal, Alex Dumas, Corporal Alex Dumas would become, he would rocket through the ranks and become General Alexander or Alex Dumas. And he would actually come to outrank Napoleon and become the um, highest ranking African American officer in a white Western army, really until our own time, until Colin Powell's time. So it's well, and I have to say, the, the way that he got there, I, I'll give you just one example of the kind of things he did. Here's a guy who grew up in, in, grew up in Haiti, right, until he was about 15. His first assignment as a general, they send him to the Alps. They send him to a glacier that is 14,000 feet um, uh, it's right where Mont Blanc is, and it is held by the Germans, and these are these really important passes in the Alps that control who can come in and out of Italy. And at the time, the, basically the Austrian Empire controls these passes, and that means they control the whole southern Europe, Italian peninsula, all those trade routes, and revolutionary France wants them, and they send General Alex Dumas, this kid from Haiti, onto the glacier, commanding 53,000 French soldiers who do not, at the time he gets there, most of them, they don't have boots. And they are fighting the best Alpine troops in the world. Well, I don't think I have to um, go into the, I mean, I won't go into the details of how, but uh, let's say he uses skills that he's learned. This is the thing that I would find that Dumas does throughout his life. He uses skills that he learned when he was hunting back in Haiti as a kid. And he actually teaches his army to trap um, animals in the Alps. And he teaches them basically, and using sort of pieces of, of metal they requisition, how to scale what seem like impregnable ice cliffs. And when he manages to scale these cliffs with 2,000, the, personally at the head of 2,000 French troops, the Austrians are, uh, well, they're, they're pretty shocked, and they surrender pretty quickly. So he takes the Alps for France. After that, he's instrumental in um, the Italian campaign, helping the, the French to, to conquer Italy. And he even then goes across the middle, fights his way across the Middle East on behalf of the French Revolution when they decide to invade Egypt. And um, at that point, he encounters um, the one enemy that he is not going to be able to beat, and that is his fellow uh, general who is also from an island, um, not the same island as him, uh, who has also taken a, a key role in the French Revolution and who, 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 who doesn't speak even very good French at the time they meet. And his name is um, General Napoleone Buonaparte. And uh, General Napoleone Buonaparte does not like the fact that uh, General Alex Dumas, I will, I will just read you one uh, uh, excerpt. I, I found this in um, 
the um, um, diaries of the physician, the medical officer, the chief medical officer of the Egyptian expedition who um, kept a record of what it was like as they were fighting their way across Egypt. And when they first got there, he, um, he wrote, among the Egyptians, men from every class who were able to catch sight of General Bonaparte were struck by how short and how skinny he was. The one among our generals whose appearance struck them much more was the general in chief of our cavalry, Dumas, man of color, and by his figure looking like a centaur, when they saw him ride over the trenches, all of them believed that he was the leader of our expedition. Well, within a year, the man that everyone believed was the leader of the French expedition in Egypt would find himself imprisoned in a dungeon um, with no hope of, of getting out, no idea who had put him there, and, um, well, um, his story goes on and on and on. And in discovering his story, as I say, he's really one of the great underdog heroes of all time. He's also maybe the greatest unknown African-American, certainly African-American soldier of, of, um, of all time. But uh, it's just his story brought me into a whole chapter of history that I think that's the reason that um, Professor Gates was was sort of stunned by the book, as I was stunned to find out that it wasn't only Alex Dumas and his fencing teacher. There was a whole generation of really talented black and mixed race men who got their chance because of the French Revolution. And there was this almost post-racial moment that opened up in the 1790s when France unilaterally decided to end the world's most valuable slave empire. And again, this is at a time when the, the French um, are really admiring everything that the Americans have done in our revolution. And I, the, the story is a lot about how the American patriots inspired the French patriots. But the one thing that the French could not st stomach, the French patriots from right to left could not understand is how could we have done what we did here and then leave slavery in place. And I even found a letter from Lafayette where he says, I would never, writing to Washington, he says, I would never have participated in your revolution if I had known you would have left slavery in place. Well, I would find that in the early 1790s, French revolutionaries across the board from men like General Lafayette all the way over to Robespierre and the most radical, from the, mo from the most conservative to the most radical, one of the few things that they agreed on was this idea that they could not have uh, a continuation of racial bias and still say that they're fighting an international uh, revolution for liberty, equality, and fraternity. So indeed, there are all kinds of interesting men who come into this story. The head of the French Senate is a black man. There are French deputies in the French, gover in the French government. They're all in Paris, not in the, in the islands. There are a number of, of, of important black officers in the French army. General Dumas is just the most outstanding of them. So it's an incredible man, and it's an incredible forgotten story of, uh, of, of a side of, of history that, um, well, seems to be more than forgotten, seems to be quite swept under the rug. But none of that was the reason why I got into writing this story. And none of that is really, I think, I think the, the real thing that, uh, that, that I, I've been sort of chewing at this story for almost not, I would say almost 30 years since I was a kid. I mean, I've been intensely researching it for about seven years. But this story has been with me since I was a kid. And that was, I'm not some military history buff. I'm not an 18th century history buff. And I really didn't know that much about African American history or slavery. So none of those, that's all sort of uh, a bonus um, and uh, a very important bonus of this story. But I am a lifelong fan of the novels of Alexander Dumas. And I got into this because that man who signed his name on the enlistment rolls, Alexander Dumas, as a way of rebelling against his father and honoring his mother, 
When he got out of that dungeon, and he would get out, he would survive his dungeon ordeal, he returned to France, and with this French woman that he had fallen in love with, uh, Marie-Louise, they gave birth to a son who he also named Alexander, and who became the Alexander Dumas that the world would know about. And what I would find is that that Alexander Dumas, the novelist, would spend his life turning his father's biography into some of the best loved stories of all time and the stories that I grew up with. So that um, Alex Dumas, the spirit of Alex Dumas, and even really the day-to-day -day things that he did, you will find in the adventures of D'Artagnan, Athos, Porthos. It's as though Ale his father was so incredible he had to split him into three musketeers. There's not that much of him in, in, the, in Aramis, but at least three of the musketeers are all Alex Dumas. And then, of course, Edmund Dantes, the character, um, uh, the, the, the central figure of the, three, of the um, Count of Monte Cristo, who begins life in this um, dungeon without hope, um, or who, who finds himself in this dungeon without hope and has to persevere. I would, in the end of, of, of or not in the end, but in, in the middle of my, of my searching for documents, I would actually find the document upon which Edmund Dantes' prison um, ordeal was based, which is actually a real, an actual prison diary of General Dumas when he was in the dungeon that his son used to, it's uncanny, when, you, when I held that in my hand, I'm, it's like reading the beginning of the, three Mus of the Count of Monte Cristo. But um, my love of the Count of Monte Cristo is really what drove me on to, this, um, to, to keep writing this story. And I'm going to like share with you one uh, a detail that is only in the book if you are the kind of person who read the acknowledgments of a book. So, and my acknowledgments are pretty long because I like to thank people. I don't like to not uh, give credit. So you got to go through a few pages of these profuse thanks. But you know that I'm, um, at the end, you'll know I'm a good guy because the last person I thank is my mom. <laughs> and I thank my mom, though, not just because I'm a good guy. I thank my mom for a specific reason because it's, uh, really, I realized that it is my mother um, and her particular experience why I wrote this book. So really briefly, m my mom, she was born in France um, in the late 1930s, and she lost her parents to the Nazis because they were Jewish, and um, she actually survived the war in hiding in France, and she made it through the war okay, and after the war, she was living in an orphanage in France, waiting for somebody to adopt her. And the first book that anybody gave her when she's in this public institution, um, along with some chocolate and some, it was in a care package, was The Count of Monte Cristo. And I knew this because as I was growing up, this battered 1938 copy of The Count of Monte Cristo was sitting on our bookshelf, and I would ask her about it, and I would ask the man who, uh, my beloved great uncle, who was the man who actually came to France and adopted her, I asked them both to tell me the story about this, this book, and I always associated Dumas and my mom a lot. And the story was this. So my mom starts reading, this is her first adult book. I mean, she had kids' books before that, but the first real book she's reading, and you know, you start reading The Count of Monte Cristo, and you're in the dungeon with Edmund, and you don't want to stop, right? It's an addictive um, read, and that's done on purpose. Dumas wrote all of his books in serial form for newspapers in the 19th century, and the idea is he wants to make you keep buying the newspaper next week. So it's very, you know, these books are like 1,500 pages long now, but there is still an addictive quality. When you start reading, you know, you're going to lose some sleep. And there was a curfew in this orphanage, and you weren't supposed to read after curfew, obviously, right? And they're, they're kids, anyway. So my mom got caught reading after curfew, and somebody took away The Count of Monte Cristo. And what I know from my great uncle is that when he came to finally adopt her six months later, he asked her, you know, he's trying to, my, mo uh, my mom didn't know this great uncle. He was from living in America, and she said, so what? Uh, is trying to figure what present can I get you? And basically she said, 
get me my Count of Monte Cristo back. And um, he bought her the same edition. And then that edition is the one that came over with her in her suitcase. And this is sort of like a backstory that show you maybe how, uh, sort of how biographer like me thinks anyway. So I like, as I was growing up, this is before I read the books, before I was reading Dumas, I had this association of Alexander Dumas and the Count of Monte Cristo especially with my mother and my family's experience in France. And so it all, and it made me interested in French history. And it probably also made me interested in the history of racism and things like that. Um, I would find out, by the way, that uh, when the Nazis marched into Paris, another thing they did is there was the only, the only statue of General Dumas that was ever put up in France was in the middle of Paris. And it went on to the Nazi French governments, the Vichy government's list of Negroid statues targeted to be taken down because it was they didn't want mixed race statues and they actually melted it down for weapons. So there is no, uh, we only, I finally found some old photographs of it, but that's all that remains. So anyway, that's the bit of the story behind that. And that led me to, you know, well, just really be obsessed with Dumas as a kid. And it led me to the, I'll, I'll, I'll end on this, the, the way that I first encountered the story of General Dumas, because how do I connect General Dumas as a fan of the novels? A lot of people are fans of the novels. Why don't we all know about General Dumas? Well, to know about General Dumas, it's this simple. You have to be enough of a fan of the Alexander Dumas novels to want to bother to read Alexander Dumas' unfinished memoir of his life, the novelist's memoir. Now, the novelist's memoir is a slightly weird book. And I think that's the reason why probably nobody in this audience has read it. And that's probably why it's been out of print for over 100 years here. And that is, I, I give you just a, an idea why is it weird. It is, OK. It's 10 volumes long. <laughs> it is an unfinished memoir that's 10 volumes long. The novelist started it when he was 45, right after he had published The Three Musketeers, The Count of Monte Cristo, a whole bunch of other novels. He wrote very, very fast. He was, the, at that time, the most popular writer in the world, quite suddenly. He starts writing his memoirs when he's 45. He writes 10 volumes. He gets up to age 35. <laughs> Volume 10 is when he's 35. Now, when he's 35, he hasn't yet written a novel. He wasn't a novelist then. So you've got 10 volumes of him that has nothing to do with the reason that people are interested in him. In him. So it is um, a little bit, it's a weird document. But what's even weirder is that the, he doesn't, in the first volume, he doesn't even get to his own birth. <laughs> now, how's, okay, he doesn't get to his own birth. And first, I'm not talking little volumes. This is over, you know, it's like uh, 250, to between 250, 300 page book. He does get to his birth after page, bit after page 200. What does he spend the first 200 pages on? It's not on the history of the world or the background of, of, uh, the Times or anything like that. No, it's, it's a mini biography of another man, the man that he most worships in his life and the man that means more to him than anybody, and that's his father, who he lost before he was five years old. And he tells the story of General Alex Dumas, and when you read that story, if you've read The Three Musketeers and The Count of Monte Cristo, as I had, it is like reading about all your favorite action heroes come to life but it's a real guy, and it begins in Haiti, and it takes place during the French Revolution, and it's, it's quite mind-blowing. And then the thing that really get, got me, though, was the point where the son, the, the novelist, where, okay, he has his birth. That's not that interesting. But then the first vividly described moment in that memoir from his own perspective is the night that his father dies. And that's why I put that at the beginning of The Black Count. The night that his father dies, the novelist claims to remember every detail of this. And uh, he certainly describes it as though he does. And he certainly went through his life feeling as though he did. And there is something so moving about this, because this is, he's, he's had 
the, the, the time that he's known his father is after his father has been this great war hero, just, but he's just gotten out of this dungeon and he's come back to a France where I told you that there was this great climate of racial liberation where um, men of every uh, race and color were allowed to, was really allowed to aspire to the very top of French society. You might even have had a French Barack Obama. It is not impossible. The first French Republic in the mid 1790s was truly going in that direction. Um, who knows, the whole history of slavery in the United States might have been a little different if you had had a multiracial French Republic, which at the time was the most powerful country in the world, continuing. But Napoleon had shut all of that down. It's a whole story we don't have time to get into. Napoleon had shut all of that down, and he had personally decided to persecute Alexander Dumas and his family. And so when the young Alexander Dumas is writing the beginning of uh, writing about that scene when um, he remembers his father dying that night. They are living almost in a kind of internal exile in France. The family, they're living in this kind of rundown castle. I mean, it is uh, the uh, sort of 18th century quality to it, but they barely can afford anything. And General Dumas, I would find from his letters at the time, had even had to write to Napoleon, to the government in Paris, asking a special dispensation to stay in his own house because as a black man, as a black veteran, it was now illegal to live within um, a certain radius of Paris, and the house was within that radius. And there is a letter asking him for dispensation to please let me stay in my, in my house. And this is a man who, this is in the year 1806, just re less than 10 years earlier, this guy had been one of the most celebrated heroes of the f of, of, of France and the French Revolution, when everything was going full guns. And I would find you know, countless descriptions from the 1790s of how this is just one of the bravest and most incredible soldiers we have. And we're proud that he is born um, with African-American features and that he was born uh, a slave, but our revolution has allowed him to do this. The French were proud of this in just six, uh, sorry, s seven or eight years later, here he is and his family is persecuted and outsiders, and there is something about that scene that even as a kid, without knowing this whole background, I just felt what it was like for this author, Dumas, Alexander Dumas, who I knew had created some of the great heroes of France, the great, and, and had written some of the great histories, the sort of popular histories of France that made everybody love the history of France, right? Americans love the history of France, reading it in Alexandre Dumas, we, you know, all for one, one for all, I mean, it, it's, you know, kind of almost erases the, uh, the uh, um, you know, horrors of the 20th century in France, you know, where they uh, had to, where they capitulated and the country uh, became an ally of the Nazis, I mean, it's all, Dumas is the countervailing glory. You know, it's everything we like to think about France. And then here is the author of that knowing that his, the real story on which he's basing it all is so hard, cruelly suppressed. And um, I would then, it's not hard to find out that the writer Alexander Dumas would spend the rest of his life trying to get his father honored unsuccessfully. He, he, he wrote one novel where, which is sort of, I call it like a dry run for The Count of Monte Cristo, where the characters are actually mixed race and black and it deals with race issues. Didn't, it didn't do well. He himself, the novelist, was subject to uh, a great deal of racism during his life and he was never able to tell his father's incredibly inspiring story that everybody should be French, people should be incredibly, you know, excited about because it shows how advanced um, they were and what an incredible man was behind these true stories. He was never able to tell that. And um, that's basically why I decided to tell it. So that's what brought me here today. Thank you. Does anybody have a question they'd like to ask? Oh, yes, ma'am. What was the... Um, oh, okay. Yes. Oh, all right. Shall we turn the microphone this way? Uh, you want to ask it personally. Oh, personally. Okay. Mm -hmm. 
Yes. 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 Um, the, oh, sorry. Yes, this lady has asked me, would this be the same Alexandre Dumas that her father had the, grandfather had the entire set of, of his novels in the gold uh, embossed edition? And yes, that is this Alexandre Dumas. We are speaking about the Alexandre Dumas who is the, the one that we all know and love, yes. And I have a question. Yes, Not a question, I have a comment. I, although we would love to, we love to share Alexandre Dumas as an African American. Yes. He is in Haitian. Ah, yes. Okay. <laughs> and second, depends how we define African American. That's right. As, yes. We, we want to share it, but he's yes. Haitian. And, and second. <clears throat> The, the, I'm sorry, I should repeat, the lady's question was, or the, the, the comment very well received is that I believe you must be Haitian, ma'am, saying that you are proud of Alexander Dumas and you're happy yes. to uh, give him as an African American, but he's actually Haitian. So he is definitely Haitian, and I would say, and African American, but I will uh, defer to you. Why is it, well, at the time, he was, what does African American mean? I mean, it depends. Well, at the time, these were the Americas, and the French called them Americans. And I mean, I was, uh, I'm very happy that he's a hero of, of Haiti, but I'm hoping that, um, I was very happy that during, for instance, Black History Month here in um, the US this year, people were able to start celebrating the life of General Dumas. So I think it's an interesting thing that he's considered an African American as well as um, a Haitian. I don't but I, I love him as a Haitian I as well. I don't mind sharing. OK, him. thank you for sharing. <laughs> I another, really appreciate that. Another thing also that yes. Napoleon Bonaparte did the same thing to Toussaint Louverture. Absolutely. He kidnapped him, put him in a dungeon in Paris. And in 1806, Napoleon took his revenge because in 1804, we kicked the French out in, from Haiti. Absolutely, that is all true. Yes, thank you. Um, if if there's oh, any, okay. So if you address this, I'm, I'm sorry, but um, do you feel that Napoleon was a racist and that was his motivation for dealing with Dumas or was this a political move because he didn't want the competition from someone who was as talented as Dumas, whether he be black or white. What was the motivation for Napoleon imprisoning him and taking him his rights away and then enacting all this legislation? Yeah, so that's a really good question. What's Napoleon's motivation? Because much of the black count, the last third of it you'll see, is really a story of this um, um, unfortunate, this, this, this really rivalry between um, uh, Napoleon and uh, Dumas and how badly it turns out for Dumas. And as I say, the rivalry re really got going during the Egyptian expedition in the desert. I found it, it, there are two answers to why it happened. Certainly, Napoleon imposed this, these race laws on France, really, really cruel and um, barbaric sort of laws that sort of give the lie to the fact that if you, if you see Napoleon as the champion of the French Revolution, he he really wasn't that in any kind of, 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 of consistent way. He was both, uh, uh, you know, he, he took away as much as he ever gave, and he destroyed the French Revolution, I would argue, and certainly for people of color, he destroyed it. Um, and the main reasons, which we don't have time to get into, really were economic. And I would find that, uh, remember I mentioned that Alex Dumas' uncle, Charles, was a slave, he dealt slaves off of a little piece of land, that piece of land called Monte Cristo in Haiti, now in the Dominican Republic. Well, Uncle Charles was a, one of the big slave dealers in, Norman, in, in, sorry, in northern France, in Normandy, and there were a bunch of other very influential ones. These guys were among the main financial backers of Napoleon's coup, coup d'etat in 1799. And so he had, there was a lot of big money behind um, turning back this side of the revolution. And in fact, it's very much connected with the history of what had been happening in Haiti at the time. Even Toussaint Louverture, who was running Haiti as a French governor, because it's, it's the, the Haitian revolution, the or Haitian revolution was happening, but the Haitian break with France did not come before Napoleon 
tried to reimpose slavery in the French Sugar Islands. Napoleon sent a huge armada to Haiti with orders to kill or capture any black who had worn an officer's uniform. And he did what he did to what the kind of thing that happened to Dumas worse happened to Toussaint Louverture and a number of others. And um, so it was an aggressive operation to reverse every racial gain of the revolution. But why did he hate Alex Dumas? I think you, there you have personal reasons as well. That same medical um, officer's wonderful memoir, which by the way, I'm the first person ever to put this into print. The, uh, only, I mean, there are a lot of things that are firsts in this book, but it's quite remark or quite shocking to me that I found a first about Napoleon, because Napoleon is the most written about historical figure. I mean, there are tens of thousands of biographies and books. It's how could there be anything not published about Napoleon? Well, I would say it's because there were people in France who really didn't want it published. So the first two volumes of the physician's um, memoirs were published, but I found a record of a third volume unpublished, and it was in that third volume that I found the passage I read to you about how the uh, Egyptians had thought that Dumas was the commander of the expedition, and throughout that volume, that unpublished volume, there are descriptions of the fights that um, the open confrontations between General Dumas and General Bonaparte that happened in the desert on the way from Alexandria to Cairo. And I would say when you read those, which I quote in the book, there's no way that a dictator, a personality like Napoleon could have tolerated anyone challenging his motives publicly in front of his generals. Dumas essentially said, I'm a general of the French Revolution and of the ideals of liberty, equality, and fraternity. Tell me, why are we about to, uh, why are we crushing Egypt for what is it to do that? Or is it to impose a new French empire with you as the uh, supreme emperor? And I think the answer was so obviously the latter that, uh, he, yeah, no, Dumas was the one, the, I would say, I would find, and you'll find it in this book, really, his big fatal flaw was he could not keep his mouth shut. He, he, he was not somebody to hold in when he thought, saw a truth. He, he said what it was. Okay, I think we've run out of time, but I'm happy to keep talking as I sign books. As you can tell, I can talk and I, I can talk, chew gum, sign, shake hands all at the same time. Very nice to meet you all. Thanks. Okay.